Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Fidaus Rai has a long standing background in bioinformatics, computational biology, and structural biology studies. Dr. Fidaus did his uh, undergraduate in molecular cell biology or biochemistry now and master in molecular biology at University of Bangsan, Malaysia. And he then went to University of Sheffield to, to do his uh, PhD and in molecular biophysics. So he holds a PhD in molecular biology from University of Sheffield. Dr. Fidal is currently uh, with the Department of Applied Physics, uh, Faculty of Science and Technology, uh, UKM, and serves as a deputy dean for research and innovation uh, for the Faculty of Science and Technology, UKM. He's also a senior research fellow in Inbasis. Dr. Fidal's research in the field of bioinformatics and molecular biophysics is research, his research group focused on the computational analysis of macromolecular structures and discovery and characterization of genome encoded non-protein coding elements and regulatory system. The research and methods developed by his group are applied in investigating how molecular level in interactions can lead to deeper understanding of biological functions, such as understanding pathogenesis mechanisms and for the development of next generation therapies. The result of his work and the group have been deployed and made publicly accessible as web application and database and published in various peer reviewed high impact journals, including nuclear acid research, science scientific report, and others highly regarded journals. Dr. Fidal is actively writing in newspaper and features articles in various um, news media and magazines. He has also co-authored two medically uh, themed books aimed at public education and for a general audience. The first book named uh, The Doctor is Sick was published by MPS Publishing and won the Anugara Puku Negara in 2017. And the second book, which was just recently released in August 2021, named The Consequence of Sequence, was published by Penguin Random House. So you can check this book out in various kind of uh, publisher, including uh, Amazon. You can get a book from Amazon as well. With that, uh, please join me to welcome uh, Associate Professor Dr. Mohamed Fidals to share his interest, uh, research findings and research interests, as well as view in the webinar with the title, Structure the Next Frontier to More in Fun or functions. Dr. Fidas, yeah. welcome. Thank you. And the floor is uh, the, the WebEx is your now. Thank you, Leong. That was a very wrong, long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh, and a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, before I start, I would like to uh, thank the MSBMB uh, as well as uh, Inbiosis for uh, giving me the opportunity to share a bit of the work that we've been doing in the lab over the past uh, few years. Okay, um, and before I begin proper, um, for some of you younger ones, uh, this is uh, the the opening scene to Star Trek, the original series where Gene Roddenberry sort of introduced it as space, the final frontier. And uh, it's about these people in this starship called Enterprise who are on a five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, and to boldly go where no man has gone before. And what I would like to talk about today is about structures. Uh, being the next frontier, and it will be the explorations of many scientists to explore strange new molecules, to seek out and discover new functions and mechanisms, and to boldly understand what no human has understood before. <clears throat> so, uh, that brings us to the title of my talk, which is Structure the Next Frontier to More Functions.
So the function of biological macromolecules, protein, RNA, and DNA are determined by the 3D structures that they can fold into. And uh, as you can see here, this is actually the first protein structure ever solved, uh, the structure of myoglobin, which was published in 1958 uh, by John Kendrew and colleagues. And as you can see there, it's not really a very beautiful looking thing to look at. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, it's a horrible object, uh, some, some of the readers had, had noted. But it was clear from this structure that uh, unlike DNA, protein structure was going to be diverse. It's not going to be a single double helical shape, but they're probably going to have to figure out the structure and fold of every single protein out there. And... Uh, by understanding the structure, we could understand molecular level function. And in this case, you can see uh, heme bind, bound to uh, the heme molecule, which is carrying iron bound to myoglobin. And in this more modern Richardson diagram, we can actually see that heme molecule there. So as you can see on, on the left and on the right, it's the same molecule, uh, but the, the left one is the more modern rend rendering of it. So, in order for us to perhaps better understand the effect of structure on function, I want to use something that we're all very familiar with, which is the COVID-19 or the SARS coronavirus 2. Okay, and I want to focus on the spike structure that we're all quite familiar with by now. And this is a rendering of that spike structure uh, where the molecular surface of it has been rendered. But I want to also show that it's actually quite complicated in the, at the molecular or atomic level, okay? So it's made out of thousands of atoms when, uh, that we can see here in this all atom model. But usually we prefer to see something which is simpler. Uh, so a rendering of the backbone only or a rendering uh, of it in ribbons, such as this Richardson diagram. This is called a Richardson diagram. And it's usually colored quite whimsically. Depends, usually we just color it to differentiate different parts of it. So in this case, you can see the spike, uh, which are actually three of the same proteins assembled together. So you can see it in blue, in green, and in cyan. And, and the spike protein here is interacting with the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is ACE2 in red. And that's where uh, that's called the receptor binding domain where the spike is actually interacting with the ACE2 protein, uh, which I've put back there. Okay, so now we can see where it was and that's how it's interacting with the ACE2 protein. Now imagine if we were to have mutations. Now we've, we've all heard about mutations a lot and these are, have given rise to the variants that we keep hearing about. So if we were to have a mutation there, and that bit of the structure is missing. Okay, so, so if we, we had that bit of mutation and that structure is missing, the effect is that the capacity of the spike to bind to ACE2 might be lost. Okay, so it's clear here that the structure of the protein determines its function. The structure shows the protein as it really is. And changes in the structure can result in changes to the function. But what does the protein data or protein structure data look like? And where and how is the data kept? So the protein structure data is basically kept in, the, in a database called the Protein Data Bank. And it is a repository of structure coordinate data uh, but what is meant by coordinate there is basically it's Cartesian coordinates where you've got X, Y, and a third dimension, which is Z. And that sort of corresponds to the atoms in 3D space. So the numbers that you can see there, uh, X, Y, and Z in the X, Y, Z columns correspond to the coordinate or where the atoms of, for example, the ones that I have marked in red, the valine uh, is in 3D space. Okay, and uh, there are about 182,000 entries in the PDB. Okay. So how are all these structured data being generated? 
So the generation of protein structure data uh, can be uh, determined or, or is done by three methods, X-ray diffraction of protein crystals, uh, we can use nuclear magnetic resonance, and we can also use cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, each of these have their advantages and disadvantages, which I have put down there. Uh, I'm not going to go, go through in detail, but uh, for each of them, there usually is some sort of limitation. For example, cryo-electron microscopy, it can solve very large assemblies, but until recently, a lot of it has been low resolution. Or for crystals, uh, we need, uh, you can get high resolutions, but it's prone to radiation damage. And of course you need to get the crystals in the first place. For NMR, you can see them in dynamics, uh, in solution, but these are restricted to small proteins. Uh, we've been talking about structure data, protein structure data. However, the vast majority of the data in biology is generated from the sequencing of DNA. And what you can see at the bottom there is what that sequence, DNA sequence data looks like. So this is my gene and that's the DNA sequence. And there are rules that allow us uh, to, to translate uh, that DNA sequence into protein sequences. As you can see there, uh, just now I show 182,000 protein structures, but for uh, DNA sequences, We've got hundreds of thousands of them, and for 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 whole sequences, they're over a billion already. So, for example, here you can date that DNA sequences now into protein, and and to show progress, rapid progress being made in DNA sequencing, I've taken here an example of of a sampling of the data for the one of our genomes. Okay, uh, that you can find in the GIS-8 database. This is what's being used to report all those variants. So on the 23rd of August, there are about 3 million, 2.9 million. But uh, yesterday, there are already 3.5 million. Okay, so it's very quick. And because of their abundance, the most common analysis in bioinformatics is to compare these sequences in a process called sequence alignment. Uh, and, and because there's so many of them, uh, there, there are lots of sequences that we can compare with. So we are basically using these alignments to understand the function and evolution of proteins. And that's fine because there are rules that allow for us to do that. Okay? But we have to take into consideration that proteins do not look like this. They're not a series of letters. They instead, they look like this, they have shape, they have structure. So the sequences that we are analyzing do not provide the structural context or do not provide any direct insights into function that analyzing the structure can allow. So let's look at the numbers again. So in GeneBank, hundreds of millions of sequences in, uh, for whole genome sequences, there are 1.5 billion already. But in the protein data bank for protein structures, there are only about 182,000. But yet, the availability of structure data, available since 1958, predated the availability of data from DNA sequencing, which is available from the 70s. So can we use the abundant sequences that we have to increase the number of structures? Now, what we know is that the information needed for a protein to fold into the functional structure is already there in the protein sequence. And this we know from the work of Christian F. Anfinson uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 1972. Okay. So can we then compute or predict the structure of the protein from the sequence? So this is called the protein folding problem. And uh, what we want to do is we get from the string of amino acids, the polypeptide sequence, and can we then fold that the way that we might fold origami into a protein structure, a functional protein structure. <clears throat> okay, so we want to get to uh, the, 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 on the left there, a string of beads, for example, of amino acids. 
and then we fold it into a functional structure. Can we get from there to there? Right? And until 2020, uh, the accuracy of structures predicted from sequence was very low and very inconsistent. However, more recently, methods that utilize deep learning has proven to be quite successful. And two notable ones are Rosetta Fold and Alpha Fold, and these have been uh, proven to be quite accurate. Now, I demonstrate this by, by showing here uh, a protein structure uh, that we have solved uh, in the lab. So we have experimentally determined it. Previously, this structure this does not have a, a known function, <clears throat> and there are not very many members of this family. Okay, so there are not very many examples of this, and this this structure was not yet has not yet been deposited in the protein data bank. So there was no way that uh, the the algorithm could figure out what it was. There was no way the algorithm could cheat, and and here I. Uh, uh, I've also predicted from the sequence uh, in blue the structure using alpha fold. And as you can see there, the experimental structure and the predicted structure match or overlap quite well. There are very little differences that I have highlighted in red. So in a way, this is very, very accurate. But that's not always the case. Uh, in this example here, uh, You've got uh, the gold being Rosetta Fold and the blue being Alpha Fold, and they do not seem to agree at all. Okay, and this protein is from uh, is the uh, damage suppressor protein from tardigrades, and in a way, this is expected for intrinsically disordered proteins or proteins that are known to be very dynamic and have no specific or fixed order to them. Okay, and. Uh, <clears throat> So in a way, this, this tells us that it's not yet time to replace those experimental methods. So let's going back, going back to those uh, numbers. Uh, in seven months, AlphaFold has predicted and made available 365,198 structures from the commonly used model organisms. Now compare that to the PDB, 182,176 structures after 50 years. So there's a clear uh, disconnect there. And of those 300 over 1,000 structures, 72,000 or about 72,000 uh, have been labeled as having no known function. Therefore, from all those structures that uh, were predicted by alpha fold, more than 72,000 have uh, unknown functions. Uh, and some of those may have known functions, but have never had their structure solved. What this means is that uh, it may have a known function, but it has an unknown mechanism. What is an example of this? Uh, for example, if you have a protein that's known to cleave DNA, and, and you know this from assays, but you do not know how it is cleaving that DNA. So that's what I mean by known function, but unknown mechanism. So you, using computational structure modeling, we have more new structures to analyze and understand and, and spending less time on trying to model or predict those structures. So how do we go about assigning the functions to this flood of structure data? We can, of course, experiment and assay them. That's true. But where do we start? Uh, what experiments do we start with? Uh, so, as demonstrated just now, the overall structure of proteins uh, are important for their functions, but only a subset of residues are directly involved in a particular function mechanism. Remember the spike and ACE2 interaction. Not the whole protein is interacting with ACE2, not all of the spike, but just some of the spike is interacting with ACE2. So not everything. And these functional residues can be conserved as what are called 3D substructures, even when the rest of the fold is different. So if we find 3D substructures with known mechanisms in structures uh, with unknown functions, 
Therefore, we can perhaps transfer that known mechanism uh, so that they may because they may be very similar. One classic example of this, uh, which is appropriate for a biochemistry crowd, is uh, the example of uh, chymotrypsin and satellisin. Both are proteases, but if you look at the picture or the diagram on your left and on your right, you can see the catalytic site of chymotrypsin and satellisin. And as you can see there, the arrangement is very, very similar. Okay, it leads to, it leads to similar chemical activity. So you've got your, uh, what is called the catalytic triad of as, uh, aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. But if you look in the background, if you focus on the background, you'll find that the white bits are not similar at all. So the fold of the protein in the background is actually very different. And uh, this is demonstrated here, uh, where satellisin is in orange and chymotrypsin is in blue. So they do not fall or they do not uh, fall into a similar structure. Uh, so it's clear here that different enzymes can carry out catalysis using the same reaction mechanism, even though they are not related. So those that is basically an example of a substructure, and that is what we define a substructure as in this work or in this talk, uh, where we have got constellations of residues. They are components of a complete or a larger macromolecule. <clears throat> and again, let's look at uh, that that histidine, aspartic acid, and serine. Uh, it makes a very strong nucleophile, so we can actually find them in in very different uh, proteins. And to explore these uh, substructures, we use a branch of discrete mathematics called graph theory. Graph theory is probably something that almost everyone here will probably have used before, and we can find it in Google, Waze, even Facebook, and many others. Okay. But in bioinformatics, um, the use of graphs is quite widespread, uh, especially in sequence database alignments, uh, genome assembly, and pathways. But for today, we will focus on a specific use, which is finding substructural similarities. So in, in the mathematics, a graph uh, is said to consist of nodes and edges. Okay? So the edges describe the relationships between the nodes. The edges can also have direction, so they can be vectors as well. Now, let's go back to that catalytic triad. So you've got aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. If you look at it, perhaps these are actually nodes of a graph. And the relationship or the distance relationships between them can actually be the edges of the graph. Okay. And we have uh, taken the side chains of amino acids and we have made them into what are called pseudoatom vector graphs. So I'm going to demonstrate how we use this to find substructures. So let's go back to that uh, catalytic triad. So just now I said we use pseudoatom vector graphs. Uh, they're called pseudoatom vectors because uh, they've got direction, as you can see there, by, uh, marked by the arrows. And uh, it's called a pseudoatom because we take these two positions to represent uh, as a pseudoatom the whole amino acid side chain. And the edges are, of course, now the distances between those nodes. And if we were to measure them, okay, we would be able to input all those numbers, the distances, into a matrix. Okay, so for example, that distance. Uh, uh, describes the distance between aspartic acid uh, and histidine, and the distance is 3.6. And we can then extract all the distances and it becomes a matrix. Okay. And we can then match all of this okay, by uh, finding the substructures in, in larger structures uh, using or by solving what is called the subgraph isomorphism problem. And there are basically available algorithms that we can, uh, the mathematics is already available. You can basically use them and they can be very uh, fast. And, and you can basically find substructures in a larger set of, of structures. So what we have done is we have taken uh, a substructure of interest and uh, 
we then try to look for that substructure in a database. So imagine this to be a database of structures and there we have found it. Okay. So this is just a, a very simplistic representation of the work that we can do. So we can find similar substructures in unrelated or highly divergent proteins. And this can, of course, help assign functions to proteins that have unknown functions. This would, of course, be very useful for the large amounts of data being generated by methods such as AlphaFold. And this is a work that is in progress in our lab. Uh, we have then uh, deployed the algorithms that we have made into web servers so that they are more easily used by, by, by other people. Uh, and uh, once we have put them online, we found that uh, these were some of the uses uh, other people were using it for. Uh, as expected, the first one to identify similar mechanisms in very diverse proteins, uh, even those that have no detectable sequence similarity. And this is mainly used by structural biologists and structural genomics group. Um, and uh, recently, uh, one of our perhaps most hardcore users uh, uh, is, is a group uh, uh, of, is, uh, of uh, Joel Sussman, and, and he has managed to, to discover a, a novel uh, uh, motif, which is a 4D motif or a 4 aspartic acid motif uh, that is bound to metal. And, and it was found because of his interest in a, an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Uh, more recently, or, well, not recently, for the past few years as well, we've we found that uh, other users are actually using it for biochemistry teaching as a tool. And this is uh, being used by several universities in Europe and, and also the United States. <clears throat> okay. So we can find uh, substructures in highly divergent uh, proteins, but can we also use something like this for drug repositioning or drug repurposing? Uh, that, that's kind of a buzzword now for SARS-CoV-2, isn't it? Uh, trying to find or trying to repurpose drugs. So if we take known drug binding sites, okay, and these uh, known drug binding sites are the substructures, can we find those substructures in protein structures that are not known to be the drug's target. If we can do that, that means we have basically found an alternative site for the drug to bind. Okay, and, and we found that, yes, we were able to carry out such, such uh, an analysis or such a search. Okay, and, and we have published that uh, as, as an application called Drug Reposer. And uh, this was published in 2019. So when the pandemic came about in 2020, we decided to see if we could use this for uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 drug repurposing. And we were able to, to, to uh, demonstrate this as a proof of concept, which we published, uh, where we were able to show that a drug reposer could be used as an integrated uh, drug repositioning and, uh, and toxicity assessment tool uh, in epidemic response scenarios. So we can, we can do it for, for, for finding, assigning uh, functions to unknown functions. We can do, use it for drug repositioning. What else can we use this substructure searching for? Uh, so we decided maybe we just explore and see what we can find. And, and to explore, you, you can't start out uh, knowing exactly what you want to find. So, so we developed an, a new program called Imagine, which basically has a more loose way of carrying out a search. Okay. And, and, and by using that, we were able to find very conserved substructures in very different proteins or in very unrelated proteins. One easy example here is this, where you've got a, a metal binding a motif consisting of a histidine, cysteine, histidine, cysteine, but in two very unrelated proteins. As you can see from uh, the coloring, uh, one is in blue and the other one is in gold. They do not match at all. 
but just a bit of it that substructure matches and overlaps very well and they sort of perform the same function which is to bind to metals okay um, so we were able to find many novel motifs that are present only in a three-dimensional context uh, which is basically if you look at the sequence it's just going to be a single residue so if you were to do sequence analysis there is no way that you can call a single residue as a motif okay <clears throat> right so what about other biological macromolecules? We've looked at how we can use substructure searching for proteins, but can we also use it for RNA, ribonucleic acids? So with mRNA vaccines, uh, there is you know, a sudden interest in RNA again. So RNA has a very, has a very uh, jagged history in terms of interest, um, you know, at first, it was thought to be just an intermediary molecule, so it's not really doing anything important, just a messenger. Okay, then uh, Tom Check and, and 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 colleagues found that oh, actually RNA could be an enzyme as well. So you know, there's an interest in it again. And then oh, okay, it was difficult to work on again. Couldn't find any application, so the interest in it waned again. And then. Uh, uh, Venki Ramakrishnan, Tom Stite, and Ada Yonef uh, got uh, or managed to solve the structures of the ribosome. So again, the interest peaked again uh, in, 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 in RNA structures. But then, um, you know, what else, what other RNA structures are there? You know, uh, can they be, they be made into therapeutics? So the interest are waned again. And then suddenly we've got the COVID-19 and uh, mRNA vaccine. So interest in RNA therapeutics has sort of picked up again okay uh, so as you can see here from this graph uh, the PDB started in 1971 okay and this is its 50th year 2021 uh, but RNA the first RNA structure was only deposited seven years later okay so even though the pace of RNA structure deposition started picking up in the 2000s uh, there was still quite a lag and there were not many tools to analyze it. So could we therefore uh, use the same methods we use in proteins for uh, finding substructures or for assigning functions in RNA structures? <clears throat> and uh, we found that yes, we were actually able to apply this very similar concepts where instead of the amino acids being uh, the, the, the pseudo atom vectors or the nodes of a graph, we instead use the bases as, as the pseudo atom vectors and the nodes for the graph and the distances between these, these bases as the edges of a graph. And uh, using uh, the method uh, that we developed, we were actually able to find novel motifs. This is one motif, motif that we were able to find in uh, ribosomal RNA structures consisting of a UAU base triple that is stacked on top of the other. And this is actually hiding in, in plain sight, uh, but uh, not, uh, uh, it was it sort of were missed because, uh, you know, if you look at uh, RNA, the bases all look very similar. So it's very hard to identify mot motifs in a jungle of things that look very similar. Okay. But can we also perhaps use uh, the, the same programs for drug repositioning, but for RNA uh, targets? So we're, we're, again, we're exploring the territory of RNA therapeutics. And yes, we found that uh, uh, as a proof of concept, uh, we carried out uh, a search for an antibiotic binding site. And we were actually able to find numerous antibiotic binding sites uh, in, in ribosomal structures. Uh, and, and this could explain uh, you know, the, the efficacy of, of some uh, 
antibiotics being different against others because if you have more sites for binding, you may have uh, you know, higher chances of disabling the 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 the, the ribosomal protein synthesis action. <clears throat> Right, uh, so uh, again, uh, we made those programs that we had developed into web servers so that they could be used by others and you, you're free to explore them as well. Uh, they call NASM, Cognac, and, and, and we also use uh, those web programs or those programs to develop a database of our, uh, interactions in RNA structures, okay? So, um, Coming to the end of what uh, I'm talking about this afternoon, it's clear that the 3D substructure searches in biological macromolecules uh, can be carried out by representing the amino acid side chains or bases as graphs. And such searches can allow for 3D substructures to be found in a database of structures uh, as demonstrated or vice versa. And it's also clear that the increasing availability of protein and RNA structures will be the new frontier towards understanding the extent of atomic level uh, mechanistic diversity or con conservation, uh, not only for proteins, but for also RNA structures. So we will be able to assign more functions and hopefully discover new biology. And of course, we can have more fun in the process. So uh, before I end my talk, I'd just like to acknowledge the many collaborators and funding I've received over the years uh, in, this, in this slide here. Uh, I won't go through each one, uh, every one of them. And of course, none of this work could have been made possible without uh, many, many talented students and postdocs I've had over the years. And before I end, I would also like to take uh, this opportunity to invite uh, all of you uh, to attend uh, this online conference, the Asia Pacific Bioinformatics Conference. Uh, this conference is usually held live, but again, this is the pandemic uh, era. So uh, the 20th edition of the Asia Pacific Bioinformatics Conference will be on the 25th to 27th of January and it will be held online and uh, the submission date has sort of been extended to the end of the month uh, it ended on the 15th but i think we can extend it until 30th of september uh, do submit papers if you if you wish to talk at this conference and uh, again thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Dr. Fidaus, for the uh, very informative talk and in for, uh, talking about the uh, structure for the protein and RNA okay. and with a very um, clear and background of the history of molecular biology toward the structural biology. And also, the uh, I think the important uh, concept here from structure to substructure and how to use a substructure for um, functional analysis and apply for drug um, drug target or drug repurposing. And also the uh, introducing many tools that have been developed in your group um, for structure analysis for both protein and RNA. So I invite uh, all the participants to put your write your questions in the chat box and I will um, read out the questions during this uh, Q&A section. So um, we have about 125 participants with us here, uh, 100 in, about 100 here in uh, Webex and about 25 in uh, Facebook. So please, uh, you're welcome to drop your questions so I may start here, uh, Dr. Klaus. From the um, structure analysis, um, we we kind of learn that uh, the evolution, right? We 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 kind of uh, link the structure with a sequence, 
with the homology modeling or homo, uh, homologs of the proteins. And, and I think that is a concept that well known for most of us. And in this case, toward the substructure, and it, it kind of uh, get out from the, the, uh, um, uh, the thought of using a homology, homology or evolution relationship. And rather than uh, rather than um, uh, a reaction or events happen between the residues in the three D space, right? So would that means that also the the combination of um, the residue, the amino acid residue in this case is twenty amino acids. It will be a, a limitation, or can we kind of uh, or kind of having a, a clue if the computer power is able to calculate and what kind of combination of each of the residue and how many residues um, generally involved in uh, in this uh, active site, for example, right? For 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 enzyme uh, catalytic activity, for example. So perhaps are, are, are there uh, what is the angle of uh, analysis in this kind of uh, a prediction, for example. Uh, yeah, Th thank you for that question. It's one of the interests uh, of our lab, actually. Uh, one, uh, as I mentioned just now, for the Imagine program, so we try to look at uh, discovering novel functions based on uh, chemical features only. So, so instead of knowing what the active site looks like, we just provide that the active site should have uh, these um, uh, these sort of chemical features, and and can then are there actually structures that have substructures that contain those chemical features, and and once we find them, uh, one of the things that we are doing is uh, looking at interfaces uh, of of. Of proteins, so you've got motifs that are interfacing uh, many assemblies, and we're we're now computationally mutating those to see whether uh, mu those mutations can result in loss of functions or can conserve the functions. And for those that look like the function can be conserved, but it's not known in nature. We're going to try and do experiments on those and see whether you know you've got that that function still preserved, uh, and and therefore you have a synthetic protein that can function uh, like that nature. It it may not be a real synthetic protein in the sense that there may actually be an example of that protein out in nature. It's just that mm -hmm. we haven't we haven't discovered it yet. Right. Yep. Yep. So it means that computer power maybe. Uh, that 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 is a bit of a problem. Yes. Uh, we 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 can do the mutations. We can do the searches, but simulating the 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 functions uh, that we have mutated. It, uh, that computing power, so so that that's a sort of a restriction or or a stumbling block, uh, on our end. Yeah. Right. Um. Thanks. Uh. For uh, for for explaining, I think uh we we see a uh, a room to explore uh, explore, for for that, and uh, we do have many questions uh in the chat box now, uh from Lina, uh for the application of substructure similarities, is it Independent of the protein fold. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the, the the quick answer is yes. It's independent of protein. Uh, it's independent of the fold. So this is the interesting thing because um, for fold similarities, we have programs like DALI, which is the, uh, the database of alignments, structural alignments, and typically when uh, you solve a protein structure. So how a structural biologist like maybe Leong uh, does is you've got a structure and then you send it to Dali, right? To figure out what sort of full family it belongs to. Yeah. 
And then uh, you might be able to find a full family, but then you can't find, okay, so it says it's a DNA binding family, but where's the DNA binding site? You can't find it. So that's where uh, programs like, uh, uh, like, like uh, the, uh, the substructure searching comes into play where it tries to find maybe uh, what the, the DNA binding site is or the active site is. So it is independent of the, of the full of the protein. So you can have, like I showed just now, similar substructures or similar active sites in proteins that have no similar folds at all. Okay. All right. Thanks for the uh, answer. So um, the coming question is, uh, um, from Lina, and for the creation of pseudo atoms vectors, I think continue from the previous question. Is there a maximum distance for its application, or maximum number of side chains that can be in included in? Uh, maximum distance. Uh, we usually go for very close uh, distances, but we don't specify a specific distance uh, but we do specify the number of uh, amino acids so it's the, the the limit is 12 at the moment but ideally you go for less because once you do 12 searches then it starts being similar with a lot of things okay, but something like just a three or four residue uh, histidine 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 in, in a four arrangement like that so that's going to be very specific uh, but if you try histidine here, histidine there, uh, arginine here, then it starts being very, very common. And you're going to find lots and lots and lots of things. Okay, so 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 that's what uh, you, you should try and avoid. But the maximum number of residues we allow is for 12. Uh, but that's not a, really a good way of searching because you, you, you get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of junk, you get a lot of rubbish. Okay, but... Um, the one one question I'm not sure what, whether the question you are asking is whether uh, the distances are fixed uh, for the pseudo atom vector distances. It is fixed for the pseudo atoms, but the distances between the the atoms are not, because uh, you can have one is like that, another one is slightly different, or further apart, and slightly one closer, it's like that. So it could all be the same substructure. But not they're not going to be atomically at the same distance, uh, so we allow for a tolerance of that. So it can be, uh, you know, three point five distance there, and, and we allow allow for one point five Armstrong. So it could be uh, three point five, three point seven, three point nine, four, and things like that. Okay. So I I hope I answered that question. <laughs> I think you does. Ah, uh, you do. Um. Um, so we come with uh, the next question from uh, that you. Given that the substructures are consistent in protein with similar functions, did you also observe any overlap between evolutionary conservations and relative position of those key amino acids? If yes, are all proteins containing in the containing the similar substructures overlap? Or only a number of them. Um, okay, uh, um, let me try to answer that. Um, so sometimes we see uh, that they have a, a general similar function. For example, you can have just now uh, the 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 uh, uh, the a group discovered using our program uh, an aspartic acid, four aspartic acids, as a motif for metal binding. But the metals that are bound to those aspartic acids are not always the same. So you can have, so uh, is the function similar? They are similar if you're talking about them as being metals, but uh, they're not exactly the same because they could be different metals. So the ultimate function could be different but you sort of get clues as to what that, that, that's, that, that is doing. So if you find, for example, if you solve a structure and you find a metal binding site and 
So that, that sort of gives you clues that, okay, for my next essay or for my next structure, I need to put in metals in there and see what happens. Okay, I hope that I answered that question. Did I? <laughs> um, for, follow from there. So it means that, um, let's say in this case of metal, right? So you found, um, let's say the, uh, um, divalent ion binding site. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, we kind of, uh, telling you, uh, from the re residues coordination, you kind of know that it's a uh, divalent ions, a uh, metal ion, but you, you probably didn't know which one is exactly right. Yes, and, that's right. Yeah, and the right. environment yeah. and, uh, because during the search, with the substructure we are having, we are searching the mean, a key residue that may be interacting with the metals, but the surround, the environment surrounding it may influencing the specific diver metal ion in this case, probably, right? That's right. You're right. All right. Uh, thank you. So, um, we are having another question here. Um, from that you as well. So you have used Rosetta for predicting the DU, DSUP protein from the water, uh, water bear. Do you think AlphaFo would have performed better? Okay, uh, so this the, the picture I showed just now is actually both AlphaFo and Rosetta. Uh, in my personal opinion, Rosetta seems to have performed better uh, in getting more ordered uh, secondary structures uh, because uh, for the alpha full prediction, it couldn't, uh, it predicted just one single long helix and the rest were disordered regions. Uh, whereas um, Rosetta full could predict a more, uh, a, a few more secondary structures and the rest being disordered regions. Having said that, uh, they could both be very, very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's still a job for a crystallographer or a cryo electron microscopist, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. Uh, predictions still need to be validated, right? With data. Yeah. Um, there's a question from our wind. Is it possible to do in silico mutational studies of protein using predicted structure um, or multi modeling, for example? If yes, how accurate it, it will be? Or will it be? Uh, how uh, accurate? To, 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 to mutate the predicted structures, um, like I said, if you, uh, for, you know, for Rosetta full and Alpha full, They've managed to get very accurate structures, but once you mutate them, then you have to do the dynamics again, because if you just mutate them, that's possible. Yes. You could see the static change in interactions, uh, but, uh, you don't know how that change is interacting with the environment or interacting with other parts of the protein. So you will still need to do some sort of molecular dynamics probably. Uh, and, um. It provides a theoretical or a hypothetical framework for you to do experiments, but uh, you would still need to follow up either with MD experiments or you know actual wet lab experiments. In my opinion, uh, unless that that change is a very similar residue. So if you mutate an aspartic acid to a glutamic acid, uh, you could see the change in hydrogen bonding or things like that, for example. Okay, but if you change a, a very drastic residue, uh, like uh, in, in, in coronavirus, you've got a, a, an aspartic acid uh, changing to a glycine. So that's a, it's a, you know, it's a biggish residue to nothing in, in a way, so, to, to no side chain. Uh, it doesn't really tell you much unless you do some sort of molecular dynamics or you actually do the experiments or you make a different structure with that mutation. So modeling has its limits. It, it, it helps you get the theoretical or hypothetical framework to proceed. Uh, but 
in some cases you have to be aware of those limitations and in some cases you can you can actually proceed uh, with with whatever you found so not not a direct answer there <laughs> that's correct um, right so we move to uh, next questions from uh, Samuel Tamil Mahmood um, it, it is possible in the future to is it possible in the future to include other molecules other than protein and RNA? I think this refer to your programs probably, like RNA, like DNA for example. Yeah. Or these two molecules has have the most important function in the cell. Uh, um, we can we can do it for DNA, but um, we haven't bothered because most of it is double helical. So there, there are not many structures that are, uh, RNA is interesting because it forms very diverse shapes, just like protein. Uh, it, you know, it can form all those ugly sausages that we saw <laughs> early on, but DNA is all those very beautiful helical structures uh, that, that, that uh, Watson was so proud of. <laughs> yeah, on one hand, maybe uh, um as a limitation of uh, DNA in forming a different kind of a structure, right? Yeah. So the so, prediction so, wouldn't. So it's, it's not. It's not very useful in the sense that there's no there's not a lot of diversity in the structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it can be done. Uh, yeah. Right. So uh, Sam also have following question: Can we use the graph theory based program in graph theory based program? in prediction structure other than binding site or active site in enzymes? Can we use it in receptor binding capacity for hormones, for example? Uh, basically, we can use it for any functional site. Uh, so even if you know it to be some sort of a band, uh, that, that this particular 3D substructure will result in a band in the structure, in a, in a band in the structure, and we want to look for those bands, then we, we, we can. Uh, it doesn't, it can be any site, any, any functional site, uh, not just catalytic sites or, or uh, what, 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 what did you call binding sites, okay? So uh, if you want to look at the receptor uh, site, as long as there are structures of the receptor and how it's binding, uh, and we can extract that information, yes, we can do it. Great. Um, the next question we have is uh, from Dr. Bagley. So, with regards to COVID-19 treatment, what would be the main limiting biological factors that contribute to the lack of effective, effectiveness of the purpose drugs for COVID-19 treatment so far? Uh, let me try to answer. With regards to COVID-19, what could be the main thing? Uh, right. Uh, my quick answer is, uh, if I knew the answer to that question, I would be giving a press conference right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry, Dr. Vasily, I do not know the answer to that question. So, there's uh, one more question that I reserve it for, 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 for now. I think, uh, let me find. All right, I think uh, this question is yeah, from Hakim uh, Lazat. Uh, what would be some advice towards yourself in the beginning of your research career? So, sorry, sorry, could you? So it would be, uh, what would be some advice towards yourself? Maybe I think, uh, I, I, oh, okay. I guess, uh, yeah. In the beginning of your research career, I think uh, maybe what would be your consideration perhaps in your research career, right? All right. Um, for me specifically, uh, pay more attention during maths class. <laughs> Not sleep so much during mathematics. So uh, <laughs> as, as you can see, a lot of the, uh, the algorithms are based in discrete mathematics and, and they're basically all of it's mathematics, all the information searching, all the information theory is mathematics. Uh, I've sort of uh, distilled all of it. So I didn't show any of the mathematics just now, except in, in diagrammatic form. Uh, but all of those searches are uh, 
mathematics base. So uh, being a, a, a biochemistry student um, and, and later on a molecular biology student, there was not a lot of undergraduate mathematics courses that I took. So I, I think I took about two maybe mathematics courses during my undergraduate years. Uh, and and uh, so when I, when I started working on this, um, I actually had to go through a few uh, discrete mathematics textbooks to, to just get my head around understanding what's going on. Uh, because, uh, you know, the structures overlapping just now that you see uh, beautifully overlap structures. Uh, they're not quite beautiful when you, you, when you think about the mathematics, because you can have math, you know, it can be this way, that way, all, all sorts of possibilities and, and, <laughs> and it gets very messy. Uh, so I, I, I took a long time getting my head around all that. So, so I, I, it, an advice to myself specifically, um, do more maths. Uh, that's it. <laughs> but to, to others, uh, it depends on what background you're from, I guess. Maybe follow by chemistry, I guess. Yeah. So if you're a mathematician, <laughs> if, if you're a mathematician, then uh, you know more biochemistry. If you're a physicist, uh, because as you can see, you can come from different backgrounds and 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 do that sort of thing. Uh, if you look at the people who are working on alpha four, uh, many of them are mathematicians and physicists, uh, not 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 biologists per se, and a lot of the uh programs that 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 we we are using in in bioinformatics in in molecular bio uh, are very mathematical if you, if you look at it that way and it's just uh i guess getting it's just i guess getting our heads around uh the, the maths and the physics because I think uh, Leong, you, you, uh, Dr. Leong is also a crystallographer, so uh, solving the, the, the structures takes a lot of physics as well in the background. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's true. That's true. So uh, I, I think uh, basic science become a fundamental uh, science become very important at the end, right? Yeah. Mathematics, yeah. physics, um, chemistry, yeah, don't separate it. I mean, like, like I said in my, in my, in my first slide, uh, you know, it's a journey for scientists in general, you know, uh, to find all these exciting new molecules, uh, not biologists, not, not, not chemists, but scientists in general, because, you know, you take physicists, you, you need mathematicians. And, and at the end, there, the people who are having the fun is also the scientists, not just a specific group of scientists. Okay. Right. Thanks for the sharing. Um, the next, we have common question. Uh, how accurate, this question from uh, Chayo, Chayo Putiman, how accurate the side chain rock numbers predicted by the computation approach? Um, So the the rotamers are based on libraries. Uh, many of the rotamer libraries that we are using now came from Roland Dumbrex group uh, at Fox Chase Cancer Research Center. Um, so how accurate are they? They're quite accurate in the sense that they are extracted from actual uh, rotameric positions. Okay, so, and, but whether the modeling is accurate or not, uh, that's an, another matter, but, but the, 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 the rotamer positions of the side chains are rather uh, correct because they're based on actual data. Right. Uh, I mean, right. Leon can probably answer that question as well because he, you know, you when you build structures, yep. it's the same. Yep. Use rotamer libraries as well. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, <clears throat> we do know from the experiment data that uh, rotamer have yeah. having a uh, 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 preferable uh, uh, 
um, angle or location that it would be. And of course, yeah. depends on uh, and, which and those are quite well established. It's quite well established, yeah. That's correct. And um, there's a question from uh, that you again to the uh, related to a DSUP or disorder region. So if a protein has many disordered region like the uh, SUP, would it would it still meaningful to predict the structure? I presume even <coughs> cryptography and NMR may not yield a consistent structure, right? So that's a question from. The um, yeah, thank you, thank you for that question. It's what we're trying to do uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. <laughs> uh so we've predicted those structures now we're trying to throw it against a database of sites and see whether we can explain the biology of it maybe it's binding to dna and protecting dna so if we can find dna binding sites that could be the right structure yeah maybe you can add a bit here i think from the sharing of uh, the day of our phone let me know as well. I think um, one can also try uh, if we know the um, partner of the protein and uh, and predict both together at the same time, right? It may also help to uh, make the disorder region maybe uh, more ordered or interact with the partner. So I think that's one of the something that I I, I learned from the webinar as well from our folk, right? And and people try to join as well uh, two proteins so that you can predict uh, complexes. I think similar things can be applied here probably to, to understand the disorder region. Um, so we have a coming question from Lina. Uh, in your opinion, will alpha full prediction reach 100% accuracy in the future or maybe resulting in better structures than the one resolved by uh, X-ray? At the moment, I'm not sure whether you can hear me very well. Um, um, at the moment, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. At, at the moment, uh, it doesn't do disordered proteins or disordered structures very well. Um, whether it will be able to do so in the future, uh, it might because as as uh, even the current one has amber, a force field attached to it, so it can relax of the uh, predictions and, and do some basic uh, molecular mechanics. Uh, but uh, for it to be really accurate, it will probably need some integrated that as well, and that's going to be computationally expensive, I think, because um, you need all the molecular dynamics. Right. Um, we have coming question from Eva. Can we predict RNA structure at atomic resolution using um, this prediction model? Um, not sure which prediction model. Or perhaps is in general, can we predict RNA structure at atomic resolution? Yes. Okay. Right. Hello? I think, uh, yeah, uh, so, sorry. <laughs> I need a system, yeah, that break a bit. Yeah, uh, uh, give me, give me a few seconds. Okay, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Clear. Can you hear me now, Leo? Yes, I can hear you well now. Uh, so uh can we predict yeah. RNA can we predict RNA structure uh in the same way that alpha fold and rosetta fold is doing it? Uh so until three weeks 
ago we couldn't, but up till three weeks ago we can. So um, there is actually a new program uh, that is able to do what alpha four can do uh, and Rosetta four can do for protein structures, but doing it for RNA structures. Uh, and, and the interest for this is to look at, especially the RNA enzymes, the, the RNA ribose switches, uh, uh, structures like that. Uh, but they probably cannot do very more, uh, uh, very large complex assemblies like the ribosome yet. So, so it's been able to do that uh, for small structured RNAs quite well. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think uh, it will move in that same direction because once they've got the deep learning uh, mm -hmm. figured out, mm -hmm. uh, it it is it is doing wonders for for the structure prediction space. I think, um, but uh, how accurate it will be as the size scales up, and your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, yeah, like we are in the era of uh, using deep learning um, approach yeah. for exploring uh, the resources of in biology. And it came to uh, our last question today for our webinar from Samuel Samuel Mahmoud: How to avoid proteins that are superior to alpha four prediction? For instance, uh, collagens. Is there any sequence hints? Uh, no, I'm I'm not quite sure I understand yeah. what the question is. Uh, what is meant by superiors to alpha four? Yeah. Uh, Maybe means uh, I'm I'm sorry. Can do well. Uh, that are uh, called collagen. Well, is collagen. Got quite a very well known structure. So. Uh, uh, many of the structural proteins have quite well known such as and and I think I showed examples of it uh, in the early slides where you've got those long fibrous proteins are actually structural proteins like collagen. Okay. I think we lost you a bit just now. Okay. Yeah, but all right. Um, there are some requests also for the contact of uh Dr. Vidal's. Um, all the participant, I think you can find a uh, contact of Dr. Vidal's in uh Inbasive web page or in also uh Oculus Science of Technology web page of UKM as well. Yeah. Um. I I can I can. I'll put it here if you uh, want. You can type it here as well, yeah. Um, I think that you have uh, perhaps um, one last question from that you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can read the question. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry for being, <laughs> that, that's okay. Uh, I'm fixated on it as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this sub is an interesting protein. I, I would agree. Um, could they both be right? You're right as well. They could both be right. Uh, uh, because there could be many states that the protein is in. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the structures do seem very drastically different. Mm -hmm. So I'm more prone to one being right or both being wrong, but not both being right uh, because uh, of how different they are. So you could have dynamic proteins that have bits flapping about, but you might usually have a core structure that is conserved. Um, but having said that, this sub is, you know, strange. It, it It's doing strange things so yeah you could be right i don't know i i, I don't ha i don't have the answer to that it's yet to explore then yeah 
Yeah. Um, so experiment data is still very important, uh, along with the computational prediction, I think. And I come to uh, the end of our webinar. Uh, from here, uh, I hope uh, we all have learned uh, quite a bit from uh, Dr. Fidel's on um, using the uh, bioinformatics to understand um, the structures and substructures of protein and RNA. And I think we also bring up to the uh, a message that uh, computational uh, power or um, programs now is uh, wisely used in uh, studying a biology. And it's as important as the uh, experimental data that we are working in the lab before. So we have came to the to the end of uh, of the webinar. I would like to thank uh, again um, Dr. Fidels for the very interesting um, presentation and the subjects. And I'm sure it has opened up uh, our view and give a uh, give us an idea on how these things will bring up. Uh, toward our future research uh, design and uh, studies. So today, uh, webinar have, um, as I mentioned, we have about 125 participants in both uh, Cisco WebEx and uh, every live page of Inbasis. And I would like to thank all participants for spending your time with us in this uh, webinar. And before this, uh, I would like to invite you um, to switch on your video um, so that we can uh, take a photo. Um, Guan Yindan and uh, Dr. Imelda, can you help to uh, guide us to these uh, photo sections? Thank you. Okay, everyone ready? Yes, mine. One, two, three. Okay, another one. Another one. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. So thank you everyone. Before we end our section today, so again, I would like to remind uh, uh, everyone that we are having this um, International Postgraduate Symposium in Biology, Biotechnology and Bioengineering uh, on the 27th and 28th of October 2021. Uh, feel free to check out the further information and join us in this symposium. And see you in uh, our coming uh, next section of our, of our webinar series. Take care and uh, stay safe. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Vidal. Thank you so much for your sharing again.